before your throne this morning thanking you for this opportunity to hear your word. We know that where two or more are gathered together, um, your spirit will be. We thank you always for this time together and for this time to receive your word and hear your word spoken, the truth out of the book, and that your words will be here and not my words. Well, we thank you always, and we pray to you in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me know when I'm ready. Okay. Welcome to Mercy and Truth Bible Church. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I got a little bit of a frog in my throat today because I've had sinus infection for the last week, a raging sinus infection, second one of this year because of all the allergies. Um, today, we want to cover a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> I want to couple of, uh, cover, the first thing I want to cover is something that's <coughs> very interesting. Um, there's this term, uh, a colloquial term in, a, in, in today's modern vernacular, it's called being pissed off. And, you know, everything goes back to the Bible and people don't realize that. And that is actually a biblical term. I want you to turn to 1 Samuel 25. I'm going to do a lot of turning today. Well, not too many. So in 1 Samuel 25, um, for those of you who are not familiar with this story, it's the story of basically about where um, King David meets his, actual, his second wife, Abigail. Uh, it's quite an emotional story, actually. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'll give you a little background. There's this uh, Abigail is married to this man named Nabal, or Nabal, depending on how you pronounce it. And he's, he's quite, a, quite a character. He's not a very nice man. And King David is in exile now from, from Saul. Uh, and with his merry band of men, he keeps um, all of the... Uh, the raiders, the local raiders from uh, various other tribes off of the lands of Israel. And he protects it. And one of the big areas that he protects is Nabal's uh, farm, essentially. And what happens is that David sends messengers, basically, to Nabal and asks for some food. And he's rebuked. And this infuriates David. And if you go to verse 21, actually, it says that now David had said, surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him. And he hath required me evil for good. Remember, that's one of the requirements in the Bible is that you do not return evil for good. That's, that's a big no-no because the Bible says that if you do that, then evil will be on your uh, doorstep forever. Verse 22, so and more also do God unto the enemies of David if I leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall, okay? That term pisseth against the wall, it's used a couple of times. It's referring to the male heirs of Nabal. For those of you who don't realize that in Israel, male heirs, that's the way you transport, transfer inheritances through the male heir. Uh, it was a patriarchal system at that time. So when he says, I will not leave any that pisseth against the wall, He's basically saying, I'm going to execute them all. I'm going to kill them all so that there's no progenitors left in Nabal so that they cannot carry on. So his lands actually will be divided up against, uh, for anybody, really. Okay, they become a free market opportunity. Now, when we say pissed off, this is in reference to this saying. What we're meaning is that we are so angry that we're angry enough to commit homicide. But let's read a little bit more. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted 
and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. So she goes first to him and acknowledges the sin of Nabal and throws herself at the mercy of King David. Notice, she doesn't go empty-handed. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. So she basically asks for, for an audience. And she says, let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. So she's saying, basically, my husband is a man of the devil. Don't listen to him, you know. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. Nabal means folly, okay, is with him. But I, but I thine handmaid, saw not the young man, the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand. Now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thine handmaid had brought unto, the, unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the Lord, the, unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thy handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all these days. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul, but the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God and the souls of thine enemies. Then them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. I'll read a couple more here. And it came, and it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee and shall hath appointed the ruler over Israel that this shall be no grief unto thee nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself, when the Lord shall hath dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, which hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. Remember, you're not supposed to avenge yourself with your own hand. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's God who avenges you. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by morning light any that pisseth against the law. So we see here the king, or the king to be, King David, was offended. He was pissed off. He was so angry as he was about to commit homicide. He was interrupted by 
Abigail, who brought to his attention the fact that it's God that avenges and that if he does this thing, you know, his kingship will be stained because he will have murdered a Israelite who, in fact, did he deserve it? Probably, but in Israel, it's a nation of laws, mosaic laws. You know, there is no law that he broke. Being a jerk, you know, is not against the law. And that's what he was. You know, David took offense to that. So why do I mention this? Because all these terms come back to haunt us in the future, and people don't know where they come from. Well, this is where it comes from. Pissing against the wall, which later has become turned being pissed off, refers to male heirs, okay? And it refers to it because, you know, a male has that physical anatomy and has that capability to do that. Now, <clears throat> what I wanted to talk about today, so as a means to start the day, I was originally taught there are five ways that Satan deceives man, but in fact, there are actually six ways, and I'm going to point them out to you today. Okay? The first thing that Satan does is he quotes and he questions the Word of God. We see this very clearly. Turn in your Bible back to Genesis chapter 3, right? Remember Genesis chapter 3, when we talked about the law of first mention, and we've talked about that many times, is the first time that you see Satan, right? And the first time that he's mentioned is a serpent, and the first time it tells you about his characteristics. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, that's a question, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Right? So, he quotes and he questions. The first thing he does in this case is he questions the word of God. Yea, hath God said? Hath God really said that? Did he say that to you? He says, you're not supposed to eat of every tree. Did he really say that? Right? He puts an interrogative question. He makes you doubt what God really said. Okay? That is the prime reason why you read your Bible. So that you can have no doubts about what God said. What did God say? Remember, we said words matter. You're going to see here, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the Genesis 3. The other ways here that Satan deceives a man, he subtracts from the word of God. Now, if you turn to Matthew chapter 4, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. What we find here, if I can find it, okay. It says, Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, now so now this is Satan's, this is Jesus Christ's temptation by Satan himself. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Right? So, he's subtracting from the word of God. Well, how is he subtracting from the word of God? Well, he says, make these stones bread. Just turn these stones to bread, Jesus. How is that a subtraction? You have to know the rest of the verse. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. So we go back into the Old Testament. Because remember, he quotes and he questions the word of God. 
And now he's subtracting from the word of God. What's he subtracting? Well, he's subtracting the rest of the verse. That's what he's subtracting. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. Now remember, Jesus Christ is fasting. He's 40 days and 40 nights here. He's in the wilderness. And fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee known that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So what's Jesus Christ's answer? But he answered, that is Jesus Christ, and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You see, Satan subtracts. He's, create me a miracle. Just, just do me a miracle. He says, I'm going to do you a miracle. He says, you've got no reason for a miracle. He says, because the miracle is reading the word of God. All right? You want to ignore the rest of the verse, that's up to you. That's what Satan does. That's a primary deception of Satan, subtracting from the word of God. You know, we talk very much over and over about the authorized version and how the authorized version is the one complete, pure translation of the Bible. All right? The new translations... You know, it's like the, the, uh, the new King James is missing like 6,000 words. That's number two on the hit list for what Satan does. So you're missing 6,000 words. The NIV, I think, is missing 66,000 words. I don't remember exactly the numbers. Thousands of words. That's what Satan does. Satan subtracts from every word of God. The scripture quote is that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. So if you're missing one word in your translation, your translation isn't pure. Every word of God is important. Every word. Because you don't understand it may not necessarily be held against you, but if you deliberately subtract from the word of God, you're in trouble. You know, if you go to Revelation, I don't have this up there, but let's go to Revelation. Revelation 22. Verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy... God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city from the things which are written in this book. So there is a curse upon people who translate the Bible improperly and leave out words. They are not written in the book of life. You know, when you do something for God, you have to do it to completion. If you fail to do it properly, there is a penalty associated with that. In this particular case, it's death. It's eternal death. I will take away his part out of the book of life. Your name is erased from the book of life. And yet people want to read all of these, you know, other versions that are missing millions of words, thousands of words, not millions. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. They don't understand. They literally don't understand that they're violating the basic principles of God. Okay. The third thing that Satan does is he adds to the word of God. So the deception, let's go back now 
to Genesis 3. And let's continue on with that story. Genesis 3, verse 3. The deception. The deception of Eve. How she was deceived. And we talked about before how her deception was Adam's fault. He didn't do his job properly. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Is that what God said? No, that's not what God said at all. In your Bible, just move to the left to verse 17, chapter 2. It's literally right across from this quote, what God says. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt not die. Thou shalt surely die. Did he tell her not to touch it? No. She made that up. She was in touch with Satan's spirit. Was she trying to impress him? I don't know. Was she deceived? Most surely. Oh, you know, God said this. And he said, don't touch it. He didn't say that. That's what Satan does. He adds. He adds to the word of God. There are Bibles out there that add things to the word of God, adds words that weren't in the original. Now, the fourth thing, the fourth principle where Satan deceives man, okay, is he denies and he derides the word of God. And all we have to do is move down a verse to verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So God says you're going to die. And Satan says, Nah, you're not going to die. I'd say that's denial, right? It is definitely deriding the word of God. He's, he's countermanding. He's, no, 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 no. God says, You're not going to die. Oh, come on. You don't believe that old big man. Yeah, nah, he's not. You're not going to die. Really? You don't believe God, but you believe Satan? Because that's what ends up happening. She believes Satan, and now every last one of us dies because of her sin. Hmm. The fifth thing is Satan privately, privately interprets the Bible. Now, we've been warned against that many times. And again, we just have to move down one more verse to Genesis 3, verse 5. For God doth knoweth that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. Now that's a private interpretation, isn't it? And ye shall be no ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You're gonna be just like God. Really? Are you like God? Well, we know good and evil. That's true. That fact was true. All of a sudden now we have decisions. We make decisions for ourselves. But we're not like God. He privately interpreted Scripture. And he deliberately lied to her so that she would basically commit suicide. That's what's going on here. He wants her to die. And she fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. Now, there's a sixth thing here that was not in the original five that were taught to me. And it's very clear. We already read about the tempter, right? He tempts man. This whole thing is about temptation, right? He tempts her against God's will. And so if you go to Matthew 4, verse 6, we go back to the temptations of Christ, right? So obviously, it's a while of the devil. Chapter 4, verse 6. 
Then the devil taketh five, we'll start at five. Then the de devil taketh him up unto the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and their hands shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Lest at any time. Notice those words. He says, lest at any time. Really? Huh. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, and find out what it really says. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massa. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. How about James chapter 1, verse 13? What does James have to say about this? James? Why can't I find James there? Dear John. Hebrews. Right after Hebrews here. There we go. James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Oh. So, Jesus tells him, you know, not to be tempted. He's not tempted. Jesus is God. He's not tempted by the devil. The devil has nothing to offer him. You know, we're tempted by our own lusts. Jesus Christ is pure. He's God. He's not tempted by anything that the devil has for him. Okay. Then there's a couple of corollaries that I've found. You know, powers that Satan wants you to believe that he has that he doesn't really have. The first one is Satan cannot read your thoughts. Jesus Christ can. Turn to Luke chapter 6, verse 8. Chapter 6 and verse 8. <clears throat> Let's back up one scripture to verse 7, and it says, and we'll, we'll set the stage here. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. Notice they were thinking, hey, if he heals this guy, we can accuse him of working on the Sabbath. That's what they're thinking. But he, that is Jesus, knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose, stood forth. Now, I defy you to go through this book cover to cover and find anywhere in it where it says that Satan knew their thoughts because it's not there. Satan cannot read your thoughts. Jesus can. That's the difference between a demon and the Lord. The Lord knows what you're thinking. A demon doesn't. A demon can look at you and predict your behavior by your actions. 
So let that be a lesson to you. You know, if you need prayer and you come up against a demon for some odd known reason, pray to yourself because he won't know what you're thinking. Very important. Let's go to Matthew 9, verse 4. Let's look at that. Matthew chapter 9, verse 4. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? So again, Jesus knows what you're thinking. You don't have to verbalize or vocalize anything. That's what Satan wants you to believe, that he's got that same power. <clears throat> but he doesn't. He does not have that power. Nowhere in the Bible does it says he can read your thoughts. Second thing, Satan uses your physical weaknesses against you. And we've read that. Let's go back to Job, right? We've seen that in this era of COVID, right? People doing anything. Uh, if I can find Job, why am I having problems finding Job? Sorry, folks, got to have a finding Job here. There we go. Job is back here. You know, I used to have these little tabs on my, uh, on my Bible, but they ripped off. Come on. Anybody got to pay for Job? Oh, hold on. Let's see. Job, page 607. Okay. Oh, I was close. I was close. There's too many sticky pages in my Bible here. Okay. So Job chapter 2, verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 4. And it says, And Satan answered and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath, he will give for his life. See, Satan knows, Satan knows you better than you know yourself. You know, unless you're firmly rooted in God's word, in the spirit of God, you will do anything to save your life. You know, there are people that have the spirit of God that have sacrificed themselves for other people because they love other people more than themselves. That's what love is. That's charity. That's love in action. Okay. Satan knows that when you use his spirit, right, he can take advantage of that. He can make you sick. He can make you take anything. Oh, I got this. I got this COVID. Take a shot. Take a shot. Take an experimental shot. Ooh, interesting. Verse 6. And the Lord said unto you, unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So who has control over your life? God. If God wants you to die, you're going to die. You know, Satan can bring you to the lowest point. Satan can bring you down, throw you into the hospital, give you the worst conditions that you could endure or imagine. But the ultimate the ultimate decision of whether you live or die is with God, not Satan. Think about that. Think about that. That should give you hope. That should give you strength. That should give you a, a firm belief, a firm 
confidence that the person who makes your decisions or the God who makes the decision whether you live or die is the absolute just ruler of the universe and will not make a mistake when he makes a decision. Interesting, because that's not what Satan is. The last one is Satan wants you to worship him. Okay? Matthew 4, verses 8 to 9. We'll go back to Matthew to the temptations of Christ. Okay. And again... The devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and sheweth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said, saith unto them, All these will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. All you got to do is worship me. That's all. You can have all the power you want. Just worship me because that's what Satan craves. What does God say about that? Two major quotes. Let's go to Exodus verse 20. All right? This was the fundamental, pivotal thing that was given to the Jews. It's basically the first of the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 6. And God spake all these words. I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's pretty clear, right? One God. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. That's a carved image when you carve carvings. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. A jealous God. Exodus 34, verse 4. You can look this up a couple places. God says this over and over again, and people don't get it. People still don't get it. And God gets pissed off. 34 verse 14. For thou shalt worship no other God. Notice small g. In the authorized version, there's a big G and there's a small g. God, the Father, is always notified with a big G. Devils, Satan, false gods are noted with a small g. A lot of people don't know that. Other Bibles, NIV, don't do that. Authorized version does that. For the Lord, whose name is jealous is a jealous God. One of God's names is jealous. He is jealous. If you stop, start worshiping other gods, he is actually jealous of that. His name is jealous. Just like Nabal's name was fool, people were named by their characteristics. Nabal, when he was a child, used to do foolish things 
So he got the name fool. You know, it's like, I'll give, I'll give you a practical example. I knew a man. They used to call his name Boom Boom. It was a bad name because he was a technician in a, um, in a laboratory, and there was a fire one time. And he thought he was smart, so he grabs a hose, and the hose was labeled hydrogen. And he was going to spray hydrogen on the fire because in his mind, he thought that hydrogen puts out fire. Where he got that from, I don't know. The only thing that saved everybody in the lab was that the engineer in the lab jumped across the room and tackled him and took the hose away from him. Okay, You see, people get names based upon their actions. God will give you a name at the judgment seat based upon your characteristics and your actions in your life. He will change your name. You will have a new name. Okay, just like Abram was changed to Abraham, father of nations. Okay, God has a name for you, but it's only after you do things that have the characteristic that define what your real character is. That's going to be your name, and it's going to be stick. It's going to be stuck with you. How would you like to go through life? and known to every person that's ever read the Bible as Nabal, the fool, right? How would you ever live that down? Well, you don't. So I hope these items help you. You know, it's, it's a short sermon today because I've got a froggy kind of throat here, and I just needed to reinforce some of these things so that you understand about the devil because we're coming to a point in time, and let's, let's face it, we're at it, about a falling away. People don't believe in the Bible anymore. People don't go to church anymore. People can't show up on time to church anymore. People don't care. They don't put and ascribe the same care and loving and understanding to it that they used to, okay? Because there are so many other distractions out in the world because Satan has used all of these techniques to deceive them, to make them think that other things are more important, more important than hearing from the Word of God. And that's what needs to be addressed, okay? You're seeing it. There was a... You know, if you look online, you can find there's articles. I think it was in Fox News where somebody did a survey and found out that most Americans no longer read their Bible. There's only like a very small percentage of people. To get on that list, all you had to do was read your Bible three times a year. And people don't even do that anymore. How sad is that? That's the great falling away. And it's caused by these basic actions that Satan has deceived the world. When we get into the tribulation, remember, we've talked over and over again, each dispensation ends in a failure, in a catastrophe. The catastrophe of Our Lady of Sienera is the tribulation, and it is a general failure of people to believe in God. And they change their belief system, and they believe in Satan's way and not God's way. That's the, that's the, um, the catastrophe of the tribulation. And that's why the tribulation is the tribulation. You know, I will show them that I am God. Right? That's what God is going to do. He's going to reprove, a little reproof, by all of these 
miraculous signs and these very severe trials that are going to come on mankind that is left on the earth. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to hear your words today. We thank you for the strength and the hope that we have in the future, and we pray that maybe people will listen, crack their Bibles, and take the Lord more seriously before this very time of the end. We thank you now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.